Thank you, Lord Tony. Well, it's simply wonderful to see so many friends together in one spot. You'll notice I did not say old friends because <laughs> many of you to this old codger look remarkably young and may God keep you that way. Everybody here from time to time has experienced remarkable providences and with your permission I wish to relate a few of those today that led to my discovery of the gospel but also to my concern about a few things in the church that I loved and which I had served for many years. Some things that I felt had to be changed or decay would set in. I'm going to forget a lot of things, so I should remind you that Dr Milton Hook wrote a book and he forgot nothing except my sins. So whatever omissions there are, they're found in Milton Hook's book. I am a ragamuffin from the northern tropics. I was born in Townsville where no self-respecting boy went into shoes before the age of 13. But at the age of 10, in the providence of God, I made the greatest discovery that anybody could make. I was a typical boy full of sins but I found a little book that had been given to my mother called Steps to Christ which has sold over 100 million copies and has been translated into 165 languages. Well, at the age of 10 I was reading some of it and I read there that the love of God is shown in every opening bud, in every spire of springing grass. I thought that was wonderful. I pictured God as looking down from heaven through a porthole, seeing all the wrong things I did and planning how to punish me for them. But here I read that his love is shown on every opening bud and every spire of springing grass. But there's something better. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 35 it says, God is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. That fitted me precisely. But what a shock. God kind to the unthankful and to the evil? Listen, I'm sure you have heard of Madeline Murray O'Hare, the best known lady atheist of the 20th century, except she was no lady and that's why she was murdered. But in her diary, page after page says, somebody, somewhere, love me. A hard-boiled atheist crying out, somebody, somewhere, love me. Well, next, I had the great good fortune to meet a personification of that love. It was a Seventh-day Adventist, Lady Cole Porter. My father had walked out from his wife and two children when I was about eight and we had moved into the heart of Townsville to be near the grandparents who were rather well-to-do. 
And to that place came a lady I can never forget because I owe her much for over 60 years of unselfish love. And it is my opinion that her behaviour of love incidentally will have influenced millions of people before time is up. She tried to comfort my mother and she saw the rowdy, dirty looking children in the yard and gave them each a copy of Our Little Friend. And she kept coming to ask what could she do to help. And she loved me for the next 60 years. And I loved her. A member of her family gave me a Bible and I had read it through by the age of 12 when I found myself in Sydney. It was wartime, 1941. There were the Allied soldiers, sailors and airmen. There were riots and battles just outside motels. I remember when the Japanese midget subs came one night and we immediately flicked the lights on but we had blackout paper over the windows and it wasn't until the morning we found out that we'd been visited by Japanese friends from far away in little tiny subs. Well, my mother and I took a room at the People's Palace, the cheapest place to get a room, and we were there for years while I went to a slum school nearby at Surrey Hills. The boys there were very rough and very tough. I think I had my last school fight there at Surrey Hills School. But the staff was wonderful. The teachers were splendid. The headmaster was a very genuine Christian. And for some reason or other, he selected me to go to a physical training institute and vacation. And when I came back, one point in every week, I was to lead the boys, it was a boys' school, march them to Moore Park, where they would go through various calisthenics, then I would march them back again. As the war was drawing to a close, the headmaster said to my mother, take him out of school. He's got his intermediate. Don't keep him there for the seniors. You've got to get him a job. The boys will all be flooding home. It would be impossible to get a job. Take him out, get him a job. So I found myself in Associated Newspapers 12 storeys high and three storeys below the ground. 1,500 employees, the biggest newspaper printing organisation in the Southern Hemisphere. And first I walked, worked in the composing room near to where the proofreaders were. And when I saw the physical state of the proofreaders, I said to myself, despite my mother's wishes, I'm never going to be one of them. They were sitting all day, and it was obvious. But I worked there in the composing room and began to write fiction, love, murder, war, perfect trash. And then I would go down 50 feet and watch the great machines turning out my trash in a magazine called The World's News, but better known as The World's Liar. About this time I began to visit the Australian bookshops in Sydney, which is a good place to look for old books, and I came across a book, The Life Sketches of Ellen White, and read all about Avondale. And as I read it, it was as though a hand was put on my shoulder. You ought to go to Avondale. My mother didn't want that. She took all my earnings except five shillings a week. She didn't want me to go to Avondale. But a former Adventist minister said, let him go and I will pay for the first year. Well, he did and I had a wonderful year. I met two great people. One was Dr. W.G. Murdoch, the first PhD I had ever seen. I didn't know what a PhD was. Was it a hippopotamus? Was it a shark? 
I had no idea, but this man came from England and he had one of these things. And he was a wonderful Christian man. He got me to do research for him. And at the end of each year, when I had no money and the board voted that I be sent away, Dr Murdoch would never permit it. And he kept me there at Avondale. I went coal portering every year end. I worked for him. I worked in the library. I worked in the kitchen. I was a waiter, etc. He said, Desmond, try and earn a little more just to placate the board. And so I did what I could. And finally, at the end of the four years, the conference that took me said, we'll take responsibility for the money. One day, Dr Murdoch said to me, Desmond, you should go to our seminary. He didn't know I didn't have the money to go to Sydney. I was existing on two shillings a week from my grandmother that covered stamps and soap. But he said, Desmond, you should go to our seminary. I went to my room and did what you should never do because this is not the way to find the will of God. But I was only a boy. I was just 18. I said, Lord, if you want me to go to America, to the seminary, please tell me. So I flicked open the Bible. Don't do it that way. It's not right. But God is very merciful. And the words I read immediately, I lowered my eyes, were, this is the thing that you shall do. 2 Kings chapter 11. And so when I married, I said to my wife, we can't buy anything except what we need to live on because we're going to America, which introduces the second person I met at Avondale, who was Gwen Booth, a much better person than I would ever be. Very kind, mild, loving, and she loved Christ. But she contracted cancer years after we were married and the cancer lasted for seven years. She never complained once. I complain if I get a pinprick. She was vomiting up to 40 times a day. My children would run to and fro with a basin, counting it, counting it. And they'd say at the end of the day, Dad, it was 40 times today. Well, after seven years, at the end of her 30s, she died. But she had arranged by way of promises that I would remarry. We had three children. I went to the division office and said, look, I'm tired out. I'm either going to leave at the next call I get or you send me to Manchester, England to do another PhD. You need an English PhD here. Too many Americans. <laughs> they said, all right, but you must marry before you go. And there was a girl in my classes. There was a wonderful young lady, most intelligent girl I've probably ever met. And you know, she did an essay for one of the classes that anywhere else would have been thought of as heresy. It was all about Antiochus Epiphanes. And I don't think she'd ever heard of him until she read a Reader's Digest article. But I, when I read the essay, of course I marked it with an A because I had this funny idea that Antichrist has many fulfilments and one of them was when the Syrian king Antiochus burned the temple and took away the daily sacrifice and for 2,300 evening mornings, there was no more of sacrifice. So, I married Jill. And we went to Manchester, to my great joy. I found she knew a lot more about languages than I did. For the first nine months, I was studying German. German theology. Nine months. Nine months. But Jill knew German better than I. And whenever I translated, I'd hand it over to her and she would correct it with pity for her ignorant husband. 
probably saved me about a year at Manchester. I had a wonderful tutor there, no classes. The, the English scheme of a PhD is wonderful. You don't do any classes. I love that. All you do is study and write. And the first time I saw him, I said, look, I'm here because I need a holiday. That's not really the appropriate thing to say. <laughs> but he said, well, there's a law here. You can't move until you've done at least two years here. He said, let's see how you go. In the province of God, I was through in about 16 or 17 months and he happened to like what he wrote. He said, go and take a holiday. Do your orals when you come back. And so that's the way that worked out. But I've left out something very important. Before Gwen's death, we found ourselves at the Adventist Seminary, Tomac University, Washington, D.C. It had no intellectual status. And one day, Dr. Heppenstall, who was the greatest theologian among Adventists, and who was better than that, he was a lovely Christian, I had written to him about my problems with Daniel 8 and Hebrews 9, which went back to when I was 15. I recall that having read Great Controversy, which I still believe is a great religious classic, despite the fact it has historical errors and doctrinal errors, but after I read it one day, I read Hebrews 9 and I got a terrible shock. I'm only 15. I'm about to be baptised. I love the new church. But Hebrews 9 says something very different to what my church was saying. It said that the day of atonement was fulfilled at the cross. Remember, I'm only 15. But it was as clear as day to me what Hebrews 9 was saying. And then I found out that at Potomac University, the investigative judgment was a matter for jeering. Roland Lowesby laughed at it, taught Greek. Sake Kubo laughed at it. He was a librarian. One of my best friends, who was to become a teacher at Andrews University for many years in Loma Linda, he tried to bring me up to date and said, yes, there's nothing in it. All our scholars know it. There's nothing in it. I remember going home to Salisbury Hall after worrying about the fact that at my school, my university, where my church had sent me so I could head up the Bible department at Avondale, what am I to say when I get back? Do I tell them that leading men at their university don't believe the investigative judgment? I was very worried, very worried. I was just crossing a stile off the busy roads at Tacoma Park, Washington, D.C., when something hit me, nothing physical, no sound, but words came to my mind, it will be all right. Don't worry. So when I got back to Australia, I said to Pastor Sibley, what do I do? Because he had told me in the long night of travel once that he didn't believe in the investigative judgment that years before he'd been appointed by the church to fight W.W. W. Fletcher, my predecessor in heresy and crime, whom everybody loved, W.W. W. Fletcher. And David Sibley said to me, I was appointed to fight him. I said, how'd you get on? He said, I found he was right. I said, what? You're a conference president. And you're telling me you don't believe one of the church's main doctrines. He said, that's right. That's right. He said, every church has problems. Many good things in Adventism. When you go to the college days, you tell them some of the problems and do your best to give some sort of answer. That's all you can do. But that didn't satisfy Pastor Palmetto, who years later became division president. Pastor Palmetto was a very capable man as a secretary. Very, very capable. But he had been told by John Brinsmead, brother of Robert Brinsmead, that I was in cahoots with Robert to bring down the church. There was no truth, whatever. I had known Robert Brinsmead for years. We'd often walked in, in the bush together and argued theology because he believed in an end-time perfectionism and I didn't. 
He believed Christ had a sinful nature and I didn't. And so there are all sorts of storms coming around Avondale and I was teaching a righteousness by faith that was different to what Adventism had taught for years. From the beginning of our movement we taught that justification plus sanctification, that's righteousness by faith. That is not correct. That is not biblical. And Robert Brinsmead found that out. I urged him to read Luther. And when he did read, he said, hey, righteousness by faith, that's justification. The moment you believe, you've got it. You have eternal life. The moment you believe, your sins have gone. Yesterdays, todays and tomorrows. He was right. The word justification in the Greek, same word as righteousness. Exactly the same word. Righteousness by faith is justification by faith. I should tell you that before I went to Avondale, I went to Melbourne. I'd never had a holiday. I thought, I'll take one before I go to Avondale. And I went to the big library there, found a book by a man called Reuben Torrey that I loved. And at the end of it, there was a list of books suggested, recommended. I wrote out the list, left the library in a bit of a daze, began looking around for a Melbourne second-hand shop. Little Burke Street, only five minutes from the library, I found one. I said, where's your theology? They said, go up the stairs. So I went up the stairs and there were myriads of books, not organised, but everywhere and everywhere. And there I secured many of the books whose titles I had written down at the library from the list by Reuben Torrey. And preeminent among them was Spurgeon. I own about 75 books that have Spurgeon's name on them. He is the most read Christian today as he has been for over a century. He was a man that loved Calvin and Luther and he loved to study and he studied and read and read and he was the greatest preacher since Paul and Luther. And when I began to read Spurgeon, I began to see what the gospel meant. I would not work my soul to save, for that the Lord has done. But I would work like any slave for love of God's dear son. Spurgeon loved to put in little bits of poetry and sayings, and that was one of them. Another one was something like this. To run and work the law commands, but gives me neither feet nor hands. Better news the gospel brings. It bids me fly and gives me wings. I began to see it. The first sermon in his book, Christ's Glorious Achievements, was we're no longer under law as a means of salvation. It's not a method. It is a standard. A Christian asked God to incline his heart to complete obedience to the divine will. And the old summary of that was the Ten Commandments. But we're not under it as a method. The only method to salvation is accepting the hand, accepting what happened at Calvary. And when you do that, you are counted 100% righteous. You're accepted in the beloved. You're complete in him. When Christ died as our representative, it meant that we died. When a representative does something, it means it's counted that all the people he represents did it. So Christ was our representative hanging there on Calvary. You died with him. I died with him. Mine are Christ living and dying as though I'd lived his life and died his death. And so the gospel began to open to me. It was not something I had to earn, not something I had to buy. It was a gift. Martin Luther used to confess for six hours a day until an abbot said to him, Martin, 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 you're angry with God. God's not angry with you. And one day, in privacy, Luther found the secret. He had thought the righteousness of God was a demand that we be righteous, that we do everything right, that we love just as we should love. But suddenly he saw the righteousness of God is not a requirement, it's a gift. To the empty hand, 
whoever feels their need. He said, paradise, the doors flew open. I became a new man. The Bible was a new book. Salvation's a gift. It's free. You can have it for the taking. You don't have to be good to be saved. You do have to be saved to be good. Well, Spurgeon taught all of that. I hear the words of love. I gaze upon the blood. I see the mighty sacrifice. And I have peace with God. As Ellen White says in one place, you need not remain a single second longer unsaved. You need not remain a single second longer unsaved. So my life now had meaning, now had purpose, now had value. But when I'm at Potomac University, I've told you the disillusionments that came. So many men there were jeering about investigative judgment. I had to go back and teach it. Evansall said to me one day, there's BDs or a dime a dozen. I'd been sent to get an MA and a BD. Evansall, the greatest man in Adventism. We were very good friends. We communicated long before we met. He said, BDs are a dime a dozen. This institution's not accredited. You'll work here for two years and you'll have nothing. He said, there's, you've got to go somewhere where you can get the beginnings of a PhD, then later in life you can come back and finish it. Well, I looked through all the catalogues of universities. I didn't like much what I read. But there was another teacher there, Winton Bevan, a very great Christian man. The teachers at Potomac were like the teachers at every university, a motley group. Some splendid, some dreadful. I went to the president one day and said, look, I wouldn't cross the road for some of your teachers, and here I've crossed the world. And I said to myself, when you get back to Avondale, you must copy the teachers you love and admire. You must not teach like some of these men teach from old mouldy paper that they wrote out decades ago. But heaven's all saying, go, get going. Witten Bevan says, I'll tell you where you should go. Go where I went. There's a Christian head of a department of rhetoric at Michigan State University. He will be fair with you. You know, when Ken Cox was at uh, Harvard, I think his tutor kept him waiting 15 years for his orals. So I took the advice of Winton Bevan and enrolled at Michigan State University. In the church nearby was a wonderful Christian pastor, John Neonis, a pastor who'd been a missionary. He said, the church, we've got a young family come. They haven't got any goods. You folks have got too many goods. Unload some of them at the home of the Fords. And so the trucks came round and we had the beds we needed, the tables and the chairs from Adventist, directed under the partnership of John Neonis. And I preached in about 50 churches while I was there in the Lansing area. And when I left, the father of Neil Wilson had his secretary send me a cheque in gratitude for the preaching in about 50, 50 churches. But when I got back to Avondale, Australia was in a hive of ferment over theology. Arguments over was Christ got a nature like ours. If so, and he was sinless, you ought to be sinless. I knew that was rubbish. The second half of every epistle of Paul makes it very clear that no Christian is sinless that all of us have to say every day, forgive me my trespasses. I knew the gospel was that just as you are, sinful, helpless, dependent, you fall at the feet of Jesus, take hold of his hands and you're accepted in the beloved and your sins are covered from yesterday, today and tomorrow. I'm not talking about willful sins. I'm talking about the fact that we all have failures, but they're not counted against a Christian, not at all. However, there were near to Avondale some dear elderly Christian ministers, good men, but they couldn't stand an inch of forward because he wasn't teaching what they had been taught. Ultimately, I was led to two trials 
in which I was accused of heresy in many, many things. In the last trial, where Pastor Frame was the head, at lunchtime, I took books out of my bag and put little slips of paper in each book. And then when it came time for me to answer my friends who were accusing me, I read one at a time from the Adventist books that were saying the same thing I was saying and then threw it down in front of my accusers and said, now what are you going to do with that? And there was such an uproar that the girls working outside thought there was a fight going on. The inside, I'm told, turned purple. <laughs> Who knows? I've got to move on to something else. Half the population of the world is feminine. How many wars would we have if women were the prime ministers or kings? A little girl once wrote, Dear God, are boys better than girls? I know you are one, but please try to be fair. <laughs> of course she was wrong. God is a spirit. He doesn't have any of the physical appendages of men and women. God is a spirit. And it takes men and women both to represent the character of God. You cannot know God if you only know men. Genesis 1.27 When you read in Genesis 2 that God took a rib from Adam and made a helpmeet for him, Matthew Henry says, the rib wasn't taken from his head, she's not to boss him. Remember that, wives. It wasn't taken from his feet. He wasn't to tread on it. Tread on her. Remember that, husbands. The rib was taken from his side. She was to be his equal, to stand by his side, to assist him, to join with him, not to be trodden on and not to be the boss. Matthew Henry's right. When the Bible says the helpmeet was made... The Hebrew word is used 16 more times in the Old Testament, always talking about God. So a woman was made like God, the crown of his creation. Very humbling. I'm a husband, my wife's so often right and I'm so often wrong. It makes life very difficult. <laughs> but, but there's the facts. Woman was God's crowning work and we're not to tread on her. Yet women have had 1% of the world's worth and done 60% of the world's work for decades. Men are like pigs. It's been perfectly legal for a husband to beat his wife as long as the stick wasn't thicker than his thumb. That was the case until the 20th century. How shocking. 1% of the world, 60% of the world can be beaten freely by husbands? The Bible is not like that. Even the Old Testament has many heroines. Deborah, not only a prophet but a judge. Holder, great leader in Israel. Ruth, ancestress of Christ. Esther, a saviour of the people. And when we come to the New Testament, Christ shows no prejudice against the other sex. Read John 4. He has more interaction with a woman of Samaria, a sinful woman with about five husbands in the past, than he'd had with Nicodemus, this top-flying Sadducee and Pharisee, in his case a Pharisee. But Christ gives more attention to the woman. John 4, compare it with John 3. Read Matthew 26. A woman anoints his feet and his head. He says, this, that this woman has done shall be told of her as a memorial for her throughout the whole world, wherever the gospel is preached. I don't read that about any man. It's very fascinating that in Mark 15, somewhere around 41, I think the verse is, it says, many women followed with him from Galilee and ministered under him. Most men have never heard of that verse. Sadly, most women haven't either. Mark 15, toward the end, many women followed with him from Galilee and ministered under him. There are about four verses in the New Testament 
that can be used against women. They mustn't speak, they mustn't preach, as long as they cook and wash and clean. Listen, there are 31,000 chapters in the Bible. There are about half a million phrases and you can't offset them by a few words. Otherwise, you're in all sorts of trouble. Have you ever read this verse? Drink no longer water. I've had at least a litre this morning. But the Bible says it. Drink no longer water. Of course, you know the rest of it. Timothy, you've got stomach troubles. Take some medicinal wine. Just don't live on water. But if you are foolish, you can take single phrases of the Bible and make rubbish out of them. If your eye offends thee, pluck it out. Most of us here have two eyes. And for the men, your eyes have certainly often offended, as mine have. If your hands offend you, cut it off. Eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Hey, do you do that literally? You must be very careful how you read the Bible. A text must be put in its context. None of the verses against women will stand up if read in context. When in Timothy, women are told that they cannot teach, the context in chapter 3 and about verse 8 says there were a lot of silly women that were listening to all sorts of heresy there in Timothy's town, which was the town of Ephesus. And Paul said, therefore, look, let's tell them, let's stop the women teaching until we get this thing straightened out. When you read the prohibition in 1 Corinthians 14 about women being silent, if you read a few verses earlier, it says the men have to be silent. Same Greek word. This is no interpreter. Let the men be silent. So I repeat, you cannot form a doctrine in the Bible from two or three or four verses. No doctrine of the Bible is like that. The Bible doctrines have an overwhelming weight of evidence. The case against women does not have that case. When you read Romans 16, you'll read about 26 friends of Paul, and many of them were women, and one of them is the Apostle, Junia, a common name for women. Junia, says the KJV, but there's no known case in history of that name being attached to a man. So in Romans chapter 16, I think it's verse 7, he speaks of a woman friend and speaks of the husband and says they're apostles. And in the beginning of the chapter, when it talks about Phoebe, it calls her a diaconos. And you and I might think of deacon, but in the chapter on deacons, chapter 6, that word is never used. But it is used over and over for ministers. When Paul says Christ called him to minister, to be an apostle, the word that's used for minister is the same word as used of Phoebe in Romans 16 and verse 1. You cannot make a case from the Bible for not ordaining women. It's important that we understand we believe in the priesthood of all believers, not just half the population of earth. The priesthood of all believers... Read it in 1 Peter chapter 2. You are a holy priesthood. He's writing to women as well as to men. You are a holy priesthood. If you look at history, you can see how God wonderfully used women. Catherine Booth, who suffered from physical pain practically all her life, was probably a much better preacher than the general a great lady. Hannah Whittle Smith, who wrote The Christian Secret of a Happy Life, preached throughout Europe and in England, greatly loved by millions of people. A mere woman. She wrote some great books. Some great books. You've heard of Mother Teresa. Don't shake your head and say, I'm not for Catholics. If anyone loves Jesus, they're your brother and sister, regardless of whether they're Methodists, Calithumpians, Seventh-day Adventists or Roman Catholics, if they love Jesus, they are your brother or sister. Mother Teresa, Albanian by birth, Indian by citizenship, Catholic by religion, her calling for the world, her heart enfolded in the heart of Jesus. At the age of 12, she gave her heart to God. 
age of 18, she left for a ministry of nuns and taught for about 16 years. Then in 1946, God spoke to her. He said, you're to leave your teaching work. You ought to go to Calcutta. You are to minister to the poor and to the sick. And she did it. And she started the Missionaries of Charity. When she died, there were 4,000 of them, all young women, pledged to poverty, to charity, to obedience. A life of that. Do you know how many partners she had in 40 countries that were helping her financially on one way or another? When she died, she had one million partners and 4,000 in her missionaries of charity. She started up institutions for people with AIDS, for people that were blind, people whose bodies weren't working properly, all the diseases you can think of. When war was on in Beirut, she got permission from both governments, East Beirut and West Beirut. Could she go and rescue the children so no children got hurt in this stupid war that men started? And they gave her permission. And the little old lady, so small, you could put her under your arm and no one would see her. So she went to Beirut and plucked out the children and made certain that they were safe and that they were well. Oh, there are so many people in history. You know, you've heard of Malcolm Muggeridge. He was a great satirist, great journalist, a great joker. He wrote books of humour. But he was asked by the BBC to go and see Mother Teresa and write up a, a documentary on her. So one day he found himself in Calcutta, wandering around in the slums, came to a filthy street, smelly, dirty, with sick people crawling all over the street. And he saw a little old lady there. He said, are you Teresa? She said, yes. He said, how long have you been here? Weeks? Months? Oh, she said, 18 years. He said, you've been in all this filth for 18 years? She said, yes, it's God's gift to me. These people I love. This is my joy to serve them. He wrote a book, A Beautiful Thing for God. She became known all over the world. She touched millions of lives. She was the greatest humanitarian of the 20th century. She got the Nobel Prize. She worked until her heart, kidneys and lungs were falling apart and died at 87. But you know we have here in this room today the person I think is the greatest Australian feminist minister. I'm talking about Joy Butler. Most of you know Joy, but you don't know what she does, perhaps. Joy Butler is doing a marvellous work in many parts of the world. She is a vice president of the International Community of Christian Women's Temperance Association. It was something like that that Ellen White spoke for and spoke to thousands of people in her lifetime. Horace Shaw wrote a big book about it, all the public speaking that Ellen White did. She couldn't be cheating from other books while she was standing in front of thousands. She just spoke and orated and spoke about Jesus in such a way that men gave up the alcohol and that women dropped off their drugs. Well, Joy Butler has been doing that for years in many countries of the world. How many of you have heard Kendra Valentine speak? Some of you have. Kendra comes from a lovely family. Jill and I know the pa parents very well indeed. We've often laughed with them and dined with them. But Kendra was a little girl of about 13 or 14 when the children crowded into the Loviac home to ask me questions on the verge of Glacier View. And Kendra said when she listened, I am going to be a minister. And so when in one of the biggest churches in USA of Adventism, before they ordained Kendra, she told the story of being in a group of children that asked me questions before Glacier View. You've heard of Corrie Ten Boom? Have you heard of Gladys Arlwood? 
the little parlour maid who took a hundred children over the mountains, keep them safe from the Japanese soldiers, wore herself almost to death. They turned it into a movie, The End of Six Happiness, but they made a great mistake. They put one of the prettiest film stars in the place of Gladys Arlwood, and Gladys wasn't pretty. She was tiny, old-looking, but one of God's saints. I could talk so much more on this, but the clock's getting away. I've, I've got to come to a close. But one or two things I must say. Pastor Parmander decided it would be more peaceful in Australia without Des Ford. He was probably right. So he said, Des, I want you and Jill to go over to America. You can teach at PUC for a while. It'll be a change for you. And you can come back and take your old position at Avondale as head of the department at the end of two years. Of course, the promise was never kept. Another promise was made. You are troubled about some of the sanctuary problems. You best go to judgment. If you accept my invitation to go to America, we will pledge you that we will have meetings on that topic. The pledge was not kept. But when Jill and I went to PUC, the people were wonderful. We loved the people at PUC. They were great and good people, wonderfully kind to us. And Bob Brinsmead was doing the circuit because he'd given up on the investigative judgment. He's going all over America, warning against it. As I've told you, Bob and I were friends, though we often didn't agree. Most of our years we were in disagreement, but we never hated each other. But the forum at PUC said, Des, will you take a meeting on the investigative judgment. I said, it'll only cause trouble. They said, no, you can say anything you like in a forum. Well, you know, if I'd been at the general conference and I'd stood up and said, have you read Galatians 3.28? There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free, male or female, no longer. I think they would have ushered me out very, very quickly. Very, very quickly. Anyway, I said to the forum, if you want to, because I was sick and tired of the fact of promises being made to deal with the subject and it was never done. And so I took a meeting and over a thousand people came. It was scheduled for a music hall, soon overflowed, up to Irwin Hall, soon they were standing after all the seats were taken. But oh, it did cause a row because most of the scholars already knew what I was to say and agreed. And many of the administrators knew and agreed, but they couldn't say so. And so they called together administrators and scholars from all over the world. It cost the greater part of a million dollars. What they should have done is said, Des Ford, go back to canvassing. Would have been a lot cheaper. Instead, as a result of that meeting, hundreds of ministers, one in every four ministers in this country, lost their job. One in every four. Others remained in who agreed with me but saw no sense in giving up ministry. I agree with that. In America, hundreds of ministers left. Hundreds of people stopped going to church. But here's the point, my friends. Here's the point. Most of Adventism is third world. We're the exception. And the third world is becoming more and more literate. And the more literate they become, the more they will understand what happened at Glacier View and the church will lose thousands upon thousands. In Rwanda, where a million were killed and slaughtered, among the murderers were 200,000 Adventists. Are you with me? Rwanda, a few years ago, a million slaughtered. Among the killers, 200,000 Adventists who'd been indoctrinated but never gospelized. That's the biggest problem with Adventism. Not just the ordination of women. Ordination as a ceremony is not found in the Bible but it's okay for a church to recognise that a woman has been called of God and to say so, ordination's okay, but it's not a biblical teaching. 
but it's okay. But when that little lady called on a nine or ten year old boy in Australia, she started something that one day would influence millions and we have yet to see it because what happened in Rwanda must not be allowed to happen in throughout India and the rest of Africa. Think of it, 200,000 Seventh-day Adventists engaged in killing. Not every one of them, of course. They're all involved one way or another. They'd been doctrinated. They hadn't been gospelized. And so, if I've worn you out, forgive me. But let me remind you, I would not work my soul to save. For that the Lord has done. But I would work like any slave for love of God's dear son. To run and work the law commands but gives me neither feet nor hands. Better news the gospel brings. It bids me fly and gives me wings.